Hi, welcome in everybody what's up, what's to up? the Huddle Up podcast, presented as always by Mile High Huddle. It's a podcast powered by Overtime Media, simulcasting here on YouTube and Facebook. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me as always, my partner in crime. You know him, you love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, did you get a chance? Well, today, Thursday, of course, is traditionally the day the quarterback talks, Von Miller talks, Vic Vangio talks, of course. Drew Locke at the podium, he was asked whether or not he feels like he's done enough to prove that, you know, he's the guy heading into the offseason. And uh, I'll get to the exact quote <clears throat> here in just a minute, but long story short, he feels like he was, quote, definitely good enough. What are your thoughts? I love this mindset from Drew Locke. Chad, we've been talking about it, that we want him to attack this offseason season one of our big things for 2020 was him taking hold of this job and acting like the guy already have it set in his mind that he's the QB one he's the face of the franchise no matter what Fangio says no matter what Elway says that's that alpha mentality that's that it factor coming out on and off the field I love this way of thinking from Drew Locke and I think it'll serve him well in the future and you know what I feel like his teammates will respect this attitude more than if he just kicked up his heels and was like, I don't know, I'll defer to the coaching staff. If he had that passive uh, Trevor Simeon type uh, personality or Pax Lynch personality, I don't think those around him would, would uh, revolve around that. But I feel like now he's taking hold of it. He's going to earn the respect of even more people in the locker room. You have to hand it to the kid that, you know what, he, in his own mind, in his own subconscious, I've seen it firsthand, he is QB1. And so he's going to attack this offseason as if he is the, the, the starting quarterback, if and unless told or proven otherwise. And for now, that's exactly what he is. He's the starting quarterback in the Denver Broncos. We've heard it from John Elway. We've heard it from Vic Fangio. He was drafted to be the future franchise quarterback. And so he has taken his place, basically. And we'll talk more about it. But first, I just want to welcome in everybody. Apologies, we're a little bit late tonight. You know, holidays, what are you going to do? Charge it to the game. People still juggling family, things going on, schedules. So thanks for bearing with us. And a lot of you yes. been hanging out in the room, I want to say hello. Stu, Buana Beast, Jay, Joshua, Noble Young, up, all you guys. Thanks for hanging out and uh, holding down the fort for us. Again, apologies for being a little bit late today. However, we are so stoked to talk to you guys. And it is Mile High Mailbag. We are your football priests. And so we're going to get into that here in just a second. First, though, a couple of quick reminders. Make sure you're following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. That is simply the best way to stay on top of everything that's happening with the show in real time, plus Denver Broncos news and announcements and programming and questions and scheduling. You want to make sure you're following the show on Twitter. And then don't forget to head on over to Apple Podcasts, leave a creative review. If you like what Zach and I are doing here, make sure it's a five-star rating. What that does, two things. Two birds, one stone. It allows you to get in on our giveaway, a hat, a shirt, whatever it might be. We randomly select a couple of names out of the hat each month. We'll announce the giveaways for December at the beginning of next week. And it also is just simply a great organic way to help support the show. But again, it is mile high mailbag time. We are your football priests. And each and every week, we look forward to being here for you to Offer the absolution and the answers to your burning Broncos questions. We're going to get to those here in just one second. I just wanted to finish this thought. And one other thing that Drew Locke said today uh, at the podium, Zach, he's going, he's planning on organizing off season throwing sessions. Now, as I wrote about earlier uh, this evening, and it's, it's an article that's going to go live here shortly after we uh, finish up the podcast, but you kind of have to be viewed as the guy not just by yourself, but by others in order to have the clout to kind of draw the time and the attention of your receivers. I mean, cause we're talking about the off season. That's a coveted time off for these guys to rest and recharge. If you're going to basically draw that attention and the time and the work and the, all that stuff, you kind of got to have the clout of being the guy. Locke said today, he completely plans on organizing off season throwing sessions, which to me is a great sign that, and I think his his receivers are going to fall right in line and be be wherever he wants to organize it. Man, it's crazy because we talked about this, Chad. I mean, bullet point by bullet point, what we want Locke to do in the offseason. That's organize uh, a throwing session, go into the offseason as the QB1 mindset, and he's doing all of that. I could not be more impressed by the way he's handling himself. You know, making the transition from college to the pros is tough in itself, but being on the bench for so long, being behind Joe Flacco, being... Uh, 
uh, the backup, the backup. He overcame all of that, and he put it aside, and he's really leading his team. And I love what I see from him on and off the field. It's true leadership. And I think for the first time since Peyton Manning, Chad, we haven't seen a quarterback in Denver do this. And I'm not making any comparisons, but it's just so encouraging that he's taking it by the horns and running with it. Absolutely. No doubt about it. And TG jumping in with a $5 donation on Super Chat. Appreciate, Appreciate you. you. means a lot, brother. Um, Steven Baumgartner, a, one of our super chat, biggest supporters you, and, and donors on super chat jumps in $10 donation. He says, do you guys think that Denver should try to sign Byron Jones? And Zach, this is a good question here by Steven, because it kind of piggybacks on an article that we published today at milehighhuddle.com. It was a round table where we went around the horn basically. And we each said, which, which pending free agent Bronco free agent, the, the team should make the top priority to re-sign, and then what outside free agent should be the top. And one of the names that kept coming up for a lot of the guys here at Mile High Huddle was Byron Jones. He's a cornerback. He's a defensive back in every sense of the word because he can play corner. Similarly to Kareem Jackson, actually, he can play corner or he can play safety. He can line him up pretty much anywhere on the field. I like Byron Jones, but I like another Jones a little bit more when it comes to putting that dollar on the table, and that's Chris Jones. You and I shared a brain on that. Yeah, I'm with you. And, you know, I, I've kept my eye, obviously, on Dallas quite a bit this season. And Byron Jones is a good player, but he's going to be way overpaid on the free agent market. And I don't think he's worth $12, 13000000 million a year, whatever he's going to get, Chad, uh, by another team. He's a good player, but the Broncos invested money in Bryce Callahan. They can still bring back Chris Harris Jr. if they want. They have some younger corners. They just paid Kareem Jackson. They're going to have to to pay Justin Simmons. They can't tie up so much money in the secondary and ignore the offensive line and ignore the wide receiver core. I would love to have a Byron Jones, but he's a luxury player on this defense. I think he's going to get paid by either Dallas or somebody else in the NFC. I don't see him coming to Denver. It'd be a a one player away type deal for a team. The Broncos are not one player away. AJ jumps in with a $2 donation on Super Chat. You, Appreciate AJ. you, bro. He says, any free agents you guys love that Denver needs to get. Now, Zach, again, this also piggybacks off of today's um, article that I just mentioned, but one guy that we've talked about on this podcast before, we're probably not going to be fully in agreement on this, is Brandon Scherf is a guy that I really like. The more I think about it, the more I like it. And I get that, uh, you know, I think the last two, for sure this year, I'm not sure about last year, I think you mentioned that it's two years now in a row that Scherf, the right guard of the Washington Redskins, former top five overall pick, um, that he has finished on injured reserve. Now, considering the Broncos being cursed in terms of signing offensive linemen on free, the free agent market who end up being injury prone, you kind of have to go all the way back, I think, to Luis Vasquez, who John Elway crushed that one out of the park, man. He was a first-team All-Pro his first year in Denver at right guard. They signed him away from the Chargers. Outside of him, Zach, the Broncos have had a lot of bad luck with with signing offensive linemen and free agency who go on to have a lot of injury issues. But with Brandon Scherf, I think he's so good and would be such a fit here, especially in tandem with with the the right tackle situation with Juwan James. you got to assume he's going to be back next year. And with Mike Munchak, the coaching, I might be willing to look beyond that unless it just gets crazy money. If, if the money gets ridiculous, then – you know, you make do with with somewhere else. You allocate your dollars somewhere else. But I like Brandon Scherf. I like Chris Jones. I like Byron Jones. Those are probably the three guys that interest me the most right now. Um, I can throw out uh, Akeem Hicks as defensive lineman. That's one guy who would play really well in Denver. In terms of Scherf, though, I wouldn't mind it so much. I understand Elway's proclivity to signing injury-prone linemen, and it hasn't worked out for them. But if it's more along the lines of a two-year incentive-laden deal, I would not mind it at all. When he's healthy, he's a very capable player. He would be a day-one starter in Denver and be a big upgraded guard. Um, over uh, Ronald Leary. I just don't see the Broncos after Donald Stevenson, Menelik Watson, and now Juwan James investing more money in a hurt line where they can either go to the draft or try to pick some up elsewhere. So that's one guy. Uh, another guy on my list, I, I do like um, James Bradbury at corner. I think he can fit in the secondary. He has the length, and I think he has the ball skills. If they want to just get a reserve guy um, without breaking the bank for a Byron Jones, but I'm, I'm fully in agreement with you. I like Chris Jones. That's my number one outside free agent priority. A defensive lineman, you might lose Derek Wolf, you might lose Shelby Harris. They're not going to rely on Demarcus Walker. They're not going to rely solely on uh, Jeremiah Jones. They need some trench building, and that's why I would like Scherf. My number one out-of-house free agent is Chris Jones. 
He's uh, in more ways than one, Chris Jones. You can't contain him. He's uncontainable. And can you imagine getting – I mean, he's good for 10 to 15 sacks basically each and every year. You're going to get that backfield penetration on the consistent level from the interior on top of what you're getting from Vaughn, from Bradley Chubb. It, it could be a phenomenal combination and collection of talent. It's one of those that I, I'll believe it when I see it when it comes to Chris Jones – because I don't think he necessarily wants to come to Denver, but I think the money's going to talk. It right. will be interesting, though, Zach, to see whether or not Kansas City manipulates the cap to try and find room for him. But they're pretty close. They're pretty strapped as it is, and they have to account for Patrick Mahomes here very, very soon. So it'll be interesting. Another guy I like is Amari Cooper, and that's someone that, as you've started covering also the NFL at large and, of course, the Dallas Cowboys, you've gotten a little bit closer look at Amari Cooper. What are your thoughts on him coming to Denver? I love Amari Cooper's game, Chad. He, to me, is the best route runner in the NFL. The only problem with him is the injury bug. He's perpetually injured. He's played through three separate leg injuries this season, and when he's not 100%, you can tell in his game. He's going to get a contract from someone, though. I think the Cowboys will retain him along with Prescott, but he's going to get a big contract elsewhere. And like I'm saying, you really can't, even though the Broncos are going to have money, you can't devote so much into one position when you have other needs to fill. I don't see, considering they have Cortland Sutton coming up, they have a couple of young guys and Patrick and Deshaun Hamilton. I don't see Elway breaking the bank for Amari Cooper, but I would like him for choosing one guy from Dallas. I'll take Cooper over Byron Jones any time of the week. And by the way, you know, the topic of free agency and, and projecting and, and spitball on this whole topic I mean, starting next week, that's basically going to be all we're talking about is free agency and draft. So yep. let's we can kind of put a pin in that. There's going to be a lot to dissect on that topic as we get an inch into the offseason. Stu, though, jumping in with a $20 Thank donation you, on Super Chat. You're the man, Stu. The best. He says, uh, we need to focus on the trenches. So if if that were the case, you know, it comes down to Chris Jones. It comes down to Brandon Scherf, Emerge, Akeem Hicks, you mentioned. But that, was, that trio emerges as kind of the pick of the litter, but – it, it will be interesting to see how the Denver Broncos end up prioritizing their needs. And, you know, Elway's going to have somewhere close to 70, if not more million to play with on, on the open market. And man, this, this off season is going to be critical Zach, because the team has drew lock now under contract cost controlled quarterback for the next three years. So if you're going to make that big play and, and rock it back into the stratosphere and be a, a competitive team in 2020 and beyond, You've really got to make hay with your resources this year when it comes to salary cap dollars and, of course, the Broncos being projected to have 12 picks. Right, and it's a good point. And I also want to throw out there in the trenches a couple of tight end names for the Broncos because I think Butt's going to be gone, Hireman's going to be gone, and I think Fan is going to be the only one left on the depth chart. Um, Hunter Henry's a free agent, and um, Austin Hooper – who played with the Falcons, a great pass catching and also a good run blocker. He's a guy that's not going to break the bank. You can get him for a two, three-year deal. Him and Noah Fant would be quite the tandem for Drew Locke as pass catching weapons in 2020. That's a good mention because he also goes back with Wade Harmon, who coached him there. Good point. Current tight ends coach in Denver, coached Hooper to a Pro Bowl uh, caliber, to a Pro Bowl berth, his one and only Pro Bowl was under the direction and coaching and tutelage of Wade Harmon. So that's a that's a good name to keep an eye on, actually. We're getting some questions here on Randall Cobb, and far be it from mm. us to ignore the will of the people here. Buona Beast, is Cobb on a multi-year deal? I don't think he is. He's listed here on Spot Track, Zach, as a unrestricted free agent in 2020. Yeah. Yeah, he was given a one-year deal by the Cowboys, and he's played really well in that offense. And that's a really interesting name because he would be a lot less – um, you know, cost controlled as an Amari Cooper type, but also a good slot guy to have. He has the speed. He can play special teams as well. He could be a punter turner for the Broncos. So they want to save a few pennies and go on the clearance rack. I would not mind Randall Cobb, who's had a good one year prove it season in Dallas. I heard from a very passionate listener down in Mexico in uh, Chihuahua. I'm not sure exactly where that is in Mexico, but one of the states there in that that fine country, but a fellow by the name of Luis Salinas, and he wanted me to give a shout-out to his boy, to his son, David. David, shout-out from Chad, shout-out from Zach from the Huddle Up podcast. You have a very outgoing and passionate dad that's looking out for you and trying to get you some some props. So uh, a hello to David and Luis. It was good to hear from you there, buddy. But um, here's one, Zach, Quentin Sullivan. Should John would John Elway take mm. a shot on AB? This is a topic we kind of crushed into the ground 
to begin this season when all the drama cropped up with him leaving Oakland. The NFL, Zach, pretty much seems like they've kind of had their fill of AB, right. and he's pretty much viewed as a cancer up to this point. I, I'd be surprised if he gets a shot anywhere else. Especially with those sexual allegations still up in the air. I think until yeah. that's resolved by the league, an NFL team wouldn't take a chance on them, and nor should they. But yeah, the Broncos are not going to bring in that cancer to the locker room. They're just getting it now to where they want to be under Vic Fangio. They still have a number one wide receiver in Cortland Sutton, and that's why I don't see a big personality like an Amari Cooper or like Antonio Brown, Odell Beckham coming in there. Absolutely, 100% no, it's not going to happen. Jason jumping in with a $5 donation Thank on you, Super Chat. Appreciate you, Jason. He says, I think Rich Scangarella will drastically improve your thoughts. Zach, my my overall take on this is the more time on task that Skangs gets, the better he's going to be as a play caller. And that is going to coincide and kind of be tethered to the overall developmental curve of Drew Locke. We've seen him. I mean, he's been better in his first four games than I expected him to be. And I've been pounding the table for the dude to play since week one, basically. Um, but there's no no end in, in sight in terms of expecting Drew Locke to not take that that step forward in year two. So combined with, you know, Skangs now, by the time you get to 2020, Skangs having had, you know, I guess it'll be 20 full games when you, well, 21 when you count preseason, full games to kind of hone his his craft as a play caller. That's the biggest thing for him is, is kind of figuring out what plays work um, from a gut level based on, you know, what the defense is given to you in game when he game plans, Skangarello, his scripted portions of his, of his game plans are always, they crushed. It works. Yeah. He, no doubt about it. Skangs can work at the NFL. It's the other part where you're having to counter adjust to your opponent's adjustments in game. And that takes time to figure out and hone. And I think the more time on tasks he gets, Zach, the better he'll be. I'm right there with you, and I think he was pretty, I wouldn't say bad, but he was very much like a rookie coordinator the first half of the season, and I think he hit his bottom in that Minnesota game where the Broncos took a major first half lead, and they lost that game because they wouldn't adjust on offense. Since that point, though, and especially since Locke's uh, you know, insertion into the lineup, you've seen the creativity from Scangarello. You've seen the confidence not only on the field with the players, but also in the play calling, the trick plays, the, the, the design runs they have, the RPOs, the pitches. That's all born in Scangarello's mind. So I fully agree with you, Chad. He has shown he can game plan. He can show he can script with the best of them. It's just when he goes off script and he has to rely on his gut, his instinct, that comes with experience, just like a quarterback. So the more time he has, the more games he has to call, the better he will be. I fully expect the Broncos offense with a healthy, um, developed Drew Locke in 2020 to be a top 10, top 15 offense with Gangarillo. And the the faster that Locke develops and the more he kind of comes into his own, the more capable you're going to see Gangarillo look. Because yeah. under Joe Flacco, Gangarillo looked like about as impotent and hapless <laughs> of an offensive coordinator as there is in the NFL Suddenly you get Brandon Allen in there who's got a little bit more athleticism and a significantly more aggressive thrower of the football, and Skangs looks even a little bit better. You're like, okay, I could see some some uh, light at the end of this tunnel. Lockett's in there, and suddenly you can catch the vision that Elway, is, you know, Elway and Fangio had for him at the beginning of the season. Now Rick jumping in with a $10 donation Thank on you, Super Chat. Appreciate you, bro. He says, I've been watching for a few weeks now, and I love what you guys give us. Thank you. Thank you. My questions are, how do you guys feel about the youth on this team, and what's your stance on this moving forward? Zach, the one thing that – I mean, there's a lot of holes on this roster, especially on the defensive side of the ball with the pending free agents that you know we'll get more into starting next week. But as far as a young core, you, these last two draft classes have been so good. Yeah. And the missing piece ultimately was the quarterback – and fortunately for Elway and the Broncos, they were able to get that quarterback in the last draft. So the one thing I'm not worried about is the young core. Moving forward, I think it's as a harbinger, what we've seen in 2018 from that group and 2019 from both groups, I think this team is, is setting themselves up for success down the road. It's just a matter of I think this is this is a, a squad, Zach, that's one more really good offseason away yeah. from turning the corner. I'm, I'm right there with you. And, and offense, it's it's so apparent now. You have the quarterback, you have the running back, you have the receiver, you have the tight end, you have the guard, the only the, and the center. The only position you're missing among that no, young nucleus on offense is a tackle. Garrett Bowles and Juwan James, they're not young, they're not rookies, they're not exactly cheap, and they're not exactly effective. So if they can get that squared away in the draft, 
this offense has a chance to have success, not just for next season, but for five, ten years down the road. Defense, you don't really think of it because you have the Von Millers, you have the Derek Wolfs, the Chris Harris Juniors, but you also have the Draymond Joneses, you have the Malik Reeds, you have players stepping, you have the Devontae Bosbys even in the Chubb. secondary stepping up. Chubb also, so very young. Um, you have a nucleus on both sides of the ball, and that's why Chad and I are saying if they can put it together in 2020, and depending on Locke's progress, this will be if not a playoff team, a team that finishes with a winning record, they're going to take a massive leap in 2020, all because of Elway's draft in the last couple of years. It's, it's, that's how you build from within, not free agency, the draft. And what Steven's saying here, too, is part of this team maintaining the momentum they've kind of built up the second half of this season, and that is getting Justin Simmons back in Denver. One way or another, Steven, it's yes. going to happen, even if it means John Elway having to franchise tag Justin Simmons buy the Broncos another couple of months worth of time to negotiate and put together a long-term deal. Cause you know, it, it's, these things take time and it's happened many times over Elway's front office career in which, you know, it doesn't quite see eye to eye contractually with the, the pending free agent. So he throws in the franchise tag and that guarantees them that locks him into the Broncos for whatever that league year is. But then it buys Elway time to put together a deal, work with the agent, work with the player, and then ultimately come to terms on some kind of a long-term extension, whether that's Von Miller, Brandon McManus, Brandon, or, uh, Brandon Marshall, uh, Demarius Thomas even was one of those guys. So I wouldn't worry too much about Simmons. One way or another, he's going to be here. Now, Andy jumps in. Do you believe that getting rid of Flacco and potentially getting Phillip Rivers to help mm. better the mentor role for Locke can help considering they're both, they both like calling themselves gunslingers. You know, if you didn't actually, what I was about to say, I don't, I was going to say, if you didn't have lock, I'd be a little bit more amenable to the idea of Phillip rivers, but even that, I'm not sure that I would, right. to be honest with you. I think Phillip rivers has kind of hit the proverbial wall. Father time came calling this year. I don't necessarily think you need a Phillip rivers, especially someone as alpha as he is. That's the last thing you need to throw into this this equation you want Locke to grow into to the franchise role you don't want to throw a, a big time alpha personality like right. philip rivers a guy who's been starting in the nfl since what whatever 2006 or 2006 or five whatever it is you you want Locke to have the rooms act to grow and and be who the broncos ultimately need him to become I, I would think that Rivers would be a better mentor than Joe Flacco, if only because he'll actually talk to Drew Locke. But they don't need any sort of um, high-profile quarterback looking over Locke's shoulder. Even if he doesn't do anything, Rivers, he would still be there. He would still be in the quarterback room. He would still be gathering press and, and gathering headlines. You don't need that. Make Locke the number one guy. And that's why I'm in favor of not having any you know, high-profile veteran name behind him. No Tannehills, no Mariotas. Give it to Brandon Allen. Give it to Brett Rippon. But make sure. Drew Locke knows, the Broncos know, everyone around the NFL knows Locke is the guy. I don't want anyone looking over his shoulder. I don't want him to feel threatened. He needs to be far and away the QB1. Logan on Facebook says, will Elway finally have the guts to cut, I assume is what he's saying, Garrett Bowles? That's not going to happen, Logan. I don't know how much of the pod you've been staying on top of these last couple of weeks, but he he's going to be a Bronco. <laughs> He's going to be a Broncos Zach in 2020, bottom yeah. line, and he's probably going to be the starting left tackle. The question is, will the Broncos exercise that fifth-year option? That's something that I think I know the answer to, but I'm still kind of questioning the team's intention because they've already colored their thinking into, you know, they're being in on bowls and, and thinking we can get by with bowls. Will that also inform their decision when it comes to the fifth-year option? I mean, they have until after the draft, so I feel like they're going to let the board dictate that. If they can come away with an Andrew Thomas or a Tristan Wirfs, they will probably decline that that fifth-year option. But he will be on the team. We just don't know the capacity in which he'll be playing on the team next year. I would willing to bet right now they're going to give him one more year as a starting left tackle. But far and away, I can guarantee they will have a competent backup behind him and Juwan James just in case they implode. They're not Their season's not hanging in the balance. They can put someone else in there. So he will be on the team. Starting, though, I'll wait and see on that. John, jumping in with kind of a shifting gears type of question, he says, do you guys think the Broncos should switch up their uniforms? I think they should branch off of their color rush uniforms. Zach, first and foremost, it's not going to happen until there's clarity at the owner uh, position here. I mean, for the, I, I don't think they're going to shake up anything uniform-wise until either Brittany Bolin officially you know, comes into her own and is given the entire enchilada to operate the team as she sees fit. 
but you know, let's pretend that that time was now let's pretend, you know, it's, she's installed as the owner and let's move on. I dig as someone who's followed the team since the early eighties, I like the color rush helmet because mm. it's not that uglier kind of sky blue that the old helmets used to be, but it does have the D and I like that because not only the coloration of the helmet and the old logo, but because of the coloration, it allows the team to, they can go blue, they can go white, they can go orange. There's a lot of different directions they could go. I would be stoked to see them kind of shake things up because what are we doing here now? It's 90, was 97 the first year or was it 96? I think it was 97, the first year of the new logo where they got out of the old D and the sky blue and the bright orange. So we're going on, you know, more than two decades anyway, since they their last uniform change. I think it's it's about time for them to kind of get with the times and change things up a little. What do you think? I'm I'm with you in the sense that I love the color rush helmet, but I don't like the rest of the uniform. I don't like the creamsicle or all orange look. I'm of the opinion that the Broncos uniforms now are among the best in the NFL. They're clean. It's a yeah. good color scheme. I, I would not be opposed to the Broncos just staying put and rotating their uniforms, having a special uh, throwback uniform every now and then. But when you have that white on white Broncos, you know, road uni now, to me, it looks pretty nice. TG, man. Him and Garrett Bowles, they are on the same plane. And I don't say that to clown at all, TG. Like, I know exactly where you're at because I'm a guy, honestly, who's who defended and, and stood by Garrett Bowles till the 11th hour, like probably the 13th hour, to be honest with you. It wasn't until I saw him completely step on his you-know-what under the direction of Mike Munchak in his third year. You know, you think finally you got Munchak here. He's going to turn the ship around. He's going to take that quantum leap forward, Garrett Bowles. He doesn't a he doesn't do that initially to start this this season and then b it seems to take a step back not only from a pass blocking perspective but from the penalties, but then you can't ignore the fact TG that Bowles has turned it around as you point out here Garrett Bowles PFF grade the last five games is ninety three point six which is an elite grade okay and that's what I'm telling you and that's why the Broncos don't expect to change at left tackle going into 2020, not necessarily, that doesn't mean they're going to take tackle off the board in the draft, but Garrett Bowles is going to be given every opportunity to maintain that job. It's just the only problem with, even as well as he's played this, let's just say the last quarter of the season, TG, think about this. At any given moment, he can pull one of those yeah. face palm situations, flag hold, whatever, tackle a dude, whatever, that completely torpedoes and derails a drive. Maybe it's in the second quarter. And it has zero, little effect on the game. Maybe it's in the clutch when you really need things to be running smoothly up front. That's the biggest problem with, T, with uh, Garrett Bowles. I mean, I guess I have that uh, reputation as being a Garrett Bowles hater, so I'll live up to it. I don't see how, first of all, pro football focus grades are not the end-all be-all. They're not this this all-knowing uh, determination of a player's ability or worth. Second of all, do those five games, is that one rating undo the last three, two and a half, whatever, going on three full seasons of Garrett Bowles as your starting left tackle? To me, it doesn't. And again, why are we lauding him for being okay for five games when you spend a first-round pick on the guy at left tackle and you passed up a lot of other players at that spot? Why are we lauding him for five games worth when, like you said, Chad, at any moment in time, he can take plays off the board, he can kill drive, he literally single-handedly has derailed the Broncos' offense. So just because he's been okay for five games, I'm not ready to say he should be the left tackle. I'm not ready to say he's fixed or he's cured. He's still an inconsistent, mediocre t tackle who I don't trust in the least for a consistent 60 minutes. Yeah, I want to see him do it for a season. I want to see him play the level he's played this last quarter of a season for an entire season, A, and B, I want to see him not be one of the top two or three penalized players in the league yes. for a season. You know, once you once you get past that, then I can get a little bit more on top of the Garrett Bowles uh, train, so to speak, but it's one of those once bitten, twice shy situations with Bowles. And here's what Fangio said today, quote, the one thing about Garrett that gets forgotten about and not mentioned much is that he's there every day. Every day to practice, every game to play, he plays every play, and he's reliable in that regard. I think that's an important quality that you're looking for in all players. He's done that. He has played better this last, I don't want to say what game it started, but his recent past, he has played better, close quote, from Vic Fangio. And by the way, Zach, I don't know if you caught this, Elijah Wilkinson's prognosis for the season finale, according to Fangio, it's pretty iffy, which means we're probably going to get a full game audition from Jake Rogers at right tackle. It'll be interesting to see. 
Wait, first of all, did Fangio throw low key shade at Juwan James there, saying he can be on every snap and play every game? Uh, second of all, why are we complimenting him for that? Why is that a commendable thing? He can play every game and he's there at practice every day. He's an NFL player getting paid millions of dollars. That's his primary job responsibility. Why is that praiseworthy? That's how low the bar is with Garrett Bowles, Chad, that we're <laughs> praising the guy for coming to practice. We're, play, we're praising him for suiting up in a game. That is not how it should be. He's on a seventh round pick. He was your first round draft pick. I, I want way more than that, than just that low level of uh of uh, adequacy black knight jumping in with a 20 dollar donation on super chat you're awesome man appreciate you so much he says i've got a question what would you rather have in terms of offensive free agents and a need in the draft minus ol running back being melvin gordon tight end austin hooper with a wide receiver in the draft or wide receiver amari cooper tight end austin hooper with a mm. running back in yes. the draft Ooh, that's interesting that's interesting. What do you think, Zach? I mean, if given the two options, I'd love to have Amari Cooper and Austin Hooper in this offense. And you're talking about probably a top 10 team there on paper with Drew Locke and Cortland Sutton, Philip Lindsay, Noah Fant. That is a lot of weapon we, rep, weaponry for a gunslinging quarterback. So I don't know if it'll happen, but I, I would definitely, I'm not a Melvin Gordon fan, first of all. He's too injury prone. Running backs are a dime a dozen. You have a franchise running back in Philip Lindsay. You have a Royce Freeman. You get Amari Cooper, though, pair him with Cortland Sutton, and Fant with Hooper. I mean, that's a really good offense on paper. And that's what I was going to say is, I would, in other words, I would rather have Amari Cooper than Melvin Gordon. And honestly, I would rather have Austin Eckler than Melvin Gordon in terms of what the Great Broncos point. need, what this offense is missing. Yes. Yeah, I, I concur with you on that. Um, Jason jumping back in, he says, with a $5 donation, thank, thank you, you so much, Jason. He says, how likely is Brett Rippon the future backup and why the high signing amount? So for those of you who can, who might have missed this or don't remember, the Broncos paid Brett Rippon. He was undrafted. They were going to take him in the seventh round but they ended up packaging their seventh round pick to move up in the trade uh, in a trade into the sixth round to get the wide out out of Colorado, Juwan Winfrey. And so fortunately to, for the Broncos, Brett Rippon ended up falling completely out of the draft. They were able to resign him, but here's what happened. There was a bigger and hotter market for his services after the draft. And the Broncos probably anticipated they might not necessarily have made that trade up to grab Juwan uh, Winfrey, had it had they known that ahead of time, long story short, they had to drop some serious coin as a college free agent to get him to come to Denver. $146,000 they guaranteed him, and that was unprecedented, not only for the Broncos, but I'm pretty sure across the NFL. It's never – no undrafted rookie's ever been given that amount of money to sign, and uh, it was all guaranteed. So even if they would have cut him on the doorstep of the season, didn't like what they saw, that was all money that they kissed goodbye. So they he – you know, here's the thing. Scangarello likes ripping a lot. And one of the two, the, the, you know, from a traits perspective, he and Drew Locke don't share a lot. It's, I mean, Locke's just a significantly superior thrower of the football and athlete. But the one thing that they did have in common, Zach, they were both four year starters at their respective schools. And that four year body of work allowed Scangarello to get into his tape and really kind of figure out what type of quarterback he was and allowed him to project how Rippon could fit into this offense. To answer the question, though, I think Rippon is going to get a chance to battle whoever the veteran stop gap is going to be next summer, whether that ends up just being Brandon Allen, whether the Broncos sign somebody and bring them in to compete. It's not going to be an open competition for the starting job. That's going to be Drew Locke. But it will be a, back, a, a battle for the backup job, Zach. Uh, Rippon's ceiling, and absolutely you're spot on with what you said, but his ceiling is that of a number two, solid number two quarterback, yeah. a long-term backup. And you know what? You can always have room for those players, but you need to have a guy who's been in the system, who's a heady, cerebral quarterback who can step in and play a game or two. That's a Brandon Allen. That's a Brett Rippon. So I agree with what you said, Chad. He will get the opportunity. I'm going to go on the limb right now. I'm going to say the Broncos do not pick up a quarterback this offseason in free agency or the draft. They're going to go into 2020 with the players they have now. They've been in the system. They've been around the team, and they have Locke as the guy. You don't need anyone else behind Drew Locke. You need a couple of young guys, a couple of depth uh, players. Other than that, though, what's the point in bringing in a Tannehill or a, a Mariota or a Ryan Fitzpatrick? All it's going to do is take away reps from the young guys. You have Brandon Allen, who's considered a veteran now. You have Rippon, who's the young guy, a dependable backup, and you have Locke as the QB1. I don't think they bring any quarterback, Chad. I think you're 
you could very well be right. I, it's a good chance that the only quarterback transaction the Broncos make in 2020 is cutting Joe Flacco. Our yep. friend Mark jumps in with a $10 donation Thank on you, Super Mark. Chat. He says, Walter Football has Jake Fromm going to Denver in the first round per Charlie Campbell. And then he said, <laughs> Brandon Perna is an uncensored version of Zach, <laughs> hashtag Zach, uh, Chad and Zach, my boys. The funny thing about it, we love Brandon Perna, Mark. Brandon actually used to be a part of Mile High Huddle. For those of you who've been around with us since the site was founded back in 2014, Brandon and is a good friend of mine. And uh, he used to make videos for Mile High Huddle from like 2014 through, I want to say, right after Super Bowl 50. And then uh, we parted ways. He his his channel took off, and Mile High Huddle kind of took off in its own direction. And but we're still really good buddies. We talk very consistently and regularly, and I love to see his success. And it was cool to see that's good Broncos uh, cross the 100,000 subscribers mark. So props to to Brandon. Love seeing him succeed and you know, really kind of carve out his own, his own little, uh, niche. Yes. Thank you. Niche. But Jake Fromm to Denver. Oh. I, I happening, dude. Charlie, Charlie Campbell, Zach, for what it's worth. He's got a lot of cred in the, in the draft community. That ain't going to happen. No. And first of all, I take that as a compliment to be compared to Perna. So I do appreciate that. Second of all, I don't really want to discredit any other media outlet. I will say that you should take what you read on Walter Football with a massive industrial size grain of salt. He is not coming to Denver from, I wouldn't look to Walter Football as your draft mecca or for your sole mock draft database. There's other sites out there that are way more reputable, including My Lie Huddle. Nice little plug. Jordan says, Brandon, everyone should be listening to the GD Mile High Huddle podcast. Per <laughs> um. All right, let's uh, let's grab a couple more here, and then we will wish you guys a good rest of your Christmas week here. Here's one from Eddie. What do you guys think of Alexander Johnson? This was something that Vic Fangio talked about today, to paraphrase him. He's been really good. He's a very talented player. The three years off from football set him back, but – the reason he was as impactful this season as he's been is because he is that talented of a player, but having that knee injury, even though he's played through it, unlike other guys we could talk about has set him back a little bit, but Fangio was very complimentary of Alexander Johnson to me, Zach it's he serves as in the minds of the Broncos. They have one of their two off ball linebacker slots locked down right. for the next five years. And that's Alexander Johnson. I do think they're going to look to make an upgrade over Todd Davis though whether it be the draft or free agency, I think they're going to look to find someone with a little bit more lateral speed yep. and a little more twitch to him. But the problem is Davis doesn't suck. He's a very good run defender. He's really instinctive and he's really good at picking the right hole most of the time and filling the right gap. It's just a matter of the right offensive coordinator and the right quarterback can really exploit him because he's, you know, once he turns his back to the line of scrimmage, dude, it's over. Yeah, you know, I've been one of the biggest uh, Todd Davis detractors out there, but he's a probably, I would say, an elite run stuffer in the NFL, chat. He constantly leads the Broncos and tackles every game, and he's good for what he is, the two-down linebacker. But Alexander Johnson is the unheralded hero of this Broncos defense. He was their catalyst for the transition they've made from a middling unit to, I think, what's an elite unit now. Ever since his insertion and also Mike Purcell into the starting lineup, when you finally have an athletic three-down linebacker like Johnson who can make make plays in pass coverage, can run with tight ends, is constantly around the football. That's what you've been missing since Danny Trevathan left after the Super Bowl. That's what you're missing all these years, and he is a monumental upgrade on Brandon Marshall, on Josie Jewell, and on Todd Davis himself. He is a linebacker for the future now, but I fully agree with Chad. I expect the Broncos to potentially move on or restructure Todd Davis, upgrade on Jewell, and get another inside linebacker in here. But Alexander Johnson, you have your ILB of the future for the next five years at least. All right, here's the last one we'll take here from Black Knight jumps back in with a $20 donation. He says, uh, getting back to the STC tweet I sent out the other day, who do you see Denver going after since I think Tom McMahon is out? He's talking about special teams coordinator. Also, do we bring back Danny Trevathan, and how would Ndamukong Sue look in our DL with Wolf, Harris, and Jones? Let's tackle the first thing uh, he talks about here. Who do you see Denver going after since he believes – Tom McMahon's going to be out. Hmm. I'm just not so sure that's going to happen yet. I know you think it's probably likely to happen, Zach, but uh, you know, I'd be lying to you if I, 
if I were to tell you that I know the name of all 32 special teams coordinators in the NFL, I don't. I, I Outside of Tom McMahon and the guys who have worked for the Broncos, I can tell you. John Harbaugh is a special teams guy. Dave Tobes is a special teams guy. It's not one. It's not a coaching uh, sector that I, I, I put a lot of my focus and attention on. But I'm again, I'm not convinced that they're going to part ways with him. What do you think? I, it's not a certainty, but I can definitely see it happening. Like we always talk about, one of two moves is going to happen. They're going to replace McMahon or Wadman or both, but one of those is going to happen. Yeah. I was uh, asked on Twitter about Dave Taub if he can come to the Broncos, and they've been there and, and tried that with him. They should have hired him over Vance Joseph in 2017, along with Kyle Shanahan. Yep. But he, I don't think, depending on his contract, like Chad, I'm not too well-versed among special teams coordinators or, or candidates in the NFL. He would be a great pick. If I had to give you a guess, though, they'll probably pluck an assistant, a young up-and-coming assistant from a really good special teams team out there, like the Ravens, like the Packers, one of those teams that constantly performs well and they can try to get an assistant. But Tob would have been a good coach, could have filled two spots, but it's ancient history now. The idea of bringing back Danny Trevathan, I love the idea of bringing back Danny Trevathan. You know, he's a uh, he's slightly injury-prone player. So if you can get him on the, the right cost, the Broncos are very well versed on what his knee situation is. Now, of course, that's not what cost him this year. But if you could get Danny Trevathan at the right price, I'd be all for it. And then Ndamukong Sue, I'm take it or leave it with Ndamukong Sue. Like, he's a very good player. I, I hesitate to call him a great player, but he's a very good player that, to me, isn't quite worth the cost. And what his right. value is on the open market, I don't think he's quite worth that. Uh, Danny Trevathan would be, uh, I would, I would like that move along with Alexander Johnson. That would be to me an upgrade on Todd Davis. I don't want Sue though. I think he's a cancer. I think he's a locker room lawyer and they don't need that. Same reason they don't need an Antonio Brown in there. They are just getting the culture now to where they want to be. They got rid of Emmanuel Sanders because he was making waves in the locker room. They're not going to bring in a guy who's known for making waves and stepping on people's heads on the field. They don't need those players on the team. I think they're good with the players they have. Bring back Shelby Harris. Bring back Derek Wolf before I sign. Natomic and Sue. Ariel, if you want to get one more in, we uh, we love you. Get it in. We'll try and buy us some time here. There's one more from Rick. He says, I believe in Drew Locke. Do you believe in Locke being the franchise quarterback moving forward? I th I've been trying to tell you guys since before the draft that he's he's got franchise tools. And this season, he that 10 weeks off, man, did wonders for him on his mental level, processing speed of understanding defenses. You know, he's not perfect. He's still a young quarterback, but he's a lot farther along than I expected him to. I would be completely remiss to suddenly change course based on the fact that he's three and one. I mean, the precedent, historical precedents Drew Locke has, has set just in this first four games, man, from the records he broke in the Houston game to join John Elway's the first rookie quarter Broncos rookie quarterback to win their first two farts, farts starts. <laughs> Now, of course, he's also the only Broncos rookie quarterback, <laughs> the only Broncos rookie quarterback to win three of his first four. And if he goes and wins four of his first five, I mean, the rest is history. So he's on that pace, you guys, to, to be that guy. I think he's got what it takes between the ears, and we all know what he's got physically. I don't see anything. I've seen nothing so far this year. Let me put it this way. That would dissuade me or disabuse me of the notion that he is that guy. He still needs more time, and it's not going to happen overnight. Worst case, he absolutely deserves 2020 as a full season audition. But I do think that he's going to make it, make more of it than that. I think he's going to be the guy in Denver for for years to come. I really do. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. I'm a big Drew Lock guy, and um, I'm not quite ready to say he's the franchise quarterback for years and years and years. I think he has a little more to prove than these only a handful of games. But I think by far he is the Broncos' starting quarterback, and he's earned that for all of 2020, unfettered, um, untouched, the understood guy in Denver. That is Drew Locke for next season. I think he's earned that. And the hype that you're feeling around Locke is different for a reason. It's different than Lynch. It's different than Keenum. It's different than Flacco because he can be the guy and he's shown glimpses of being the guy. And not just for a season or two, not as a placeholder, not as a bridge starter, not as a bide your time kind of guy, a true franchise young signal caller who can go potentially toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Mahomes, with the Lamar Jacksons. The Broncos have that now, and that's why they should do everything in their power to nurture him for next season. Ariel, you didn't have to throw in 10 bucks, dude. I <laughs> appreciate you. We do appreciate you so much. Um, do you guys think that with the quarterback situation already figured out, should the Broncos aim money 
and free agents for the O-line instead of the draft. Thanks for the awesome work, guys. Appreciate you. Um, free agent dollars, like – No, I mean, I think I think there's a way to do both. As I've said earlier in this podcast, I, I like the idea. I kind of doubted it for a minute, but after chewing on it a little bit longer, I like the idea of going after Brandon Scherf if you, in free agency, unless it's like a market-setting type of deal for a right guard, then I want out of that. But if you can get him at a relatively reasonable price, and by that I just mean you know, you're not doing like they did last year with, with Juwan James where when he was signed, he was the, it was the highest right tackle uh, contract given out in free agency in NFL history. I don't want market setting type of precedence when it comes to Brandon Scherf because of the precedent with Juwan James and because of it's just it's just bad form. All right, but I do like the idea of Brandon Scherf coming to Denver and building through the free agency as far as the offensive line building through free agency. But this is going to be a good year for offensive tackle depth, especially Zach in the in the draft. So. I think there's a way to balance both, to be honest with you. I don't understand why it can't be both. Why can't, Why does it have to be one or the other? Why They're going to have $70 million at least and 12 draft picks. Why can't they sign a Scherf at guard and draft a tackle like a Wurfs or a Thomas so you have them on the roster? They need to build the trenches. They've ignored it enough over the years. And one thing we've seen from the Ronald Learys and the Juwan James and the Stevensons, free agent linemen don't really work out because if there's a good lineman, teams don't let those players get away. The only way to let them get away is if they're underperforming or they're injury prone. And the Broncos have made a habit signing those cast-offs. They need to build from within, develop their own players. That's why I'm saying go to the draft, build the trenches up, use the first couple picks on linemen, defensive linemen, offensive linemen. doesn't have to be one or the other. If they go that route, though, the first person who will thank Elway is Drew Locke. All right, one more. Black Knight jumping back in. He says, any thoughts on doing a live stream of Fan Speaks Ultimate GM? I'm wondering what your dream team would look like. That's an interesting idea and something that we could tackle in the offseason, Zach. I, I'd be, I'll be honest with you. I'm not 100% well-versed on, on – I know what Fan Speak is, but I've never done their Ultimate GM. I've used them for their draft, uh, their mock drafts that right. we've, we've used them for in terms of creating content and doing it also on the pod. But we, uh, let me let me spend some time, Black Knight, eyeballing that and uh, seeing how we can fit it in. But we got a lot of plans for the offseason in terms of working you guys into our podcast, uh, helping us do mock drafts, participating on breaking down videos of prospects, whether it's and if whether it's uh, free agents or whether it's draft prospects. So we'll we'll get around to it. It's an interesting idea, though, Zach. Yeah, it is. And I'm with you. I, I've never really used the GM uh, simulator. I've used their draft simulator and it's great. But yeah, we're going to have a lot of interactive things into the new year, a lot of things to get our followers involved and our listeners involved and reward our super chat donors who have been so amazing every single podcast. This next year coming up is going to be revolutionary, I would say, for the Huddle Up podcast and all of you guys. And we're so proud to have you along for the ride. It's going to be exciting. Buck now, for those of you who missed it, Glenn's talking about my new little doggy that I, I got as a birthday surprise a couple weeks ago. Buck, he's a uh, little black smudge, basically. You can barely see his I, – I put him up here and show him to you, but he's so black, his fur, that you can't see his features. I've tried to get him through pictures, and even if I do different uh, filters and stuff, you just can't see his face. But he's great. Other than Zach, I don't know if you've ever had to train a puppy before, but they yep. they pee and they poop on everything and all the time. And it just, you know, it's, it takes time to, to train them up on where they can do that and where they can't. And we've made some progress in that department, but we're still a ways away from <laughs> uh, making him a big boy. Let's just put it that way. But thanks for asking. Yeah, it's a transition. That's why I think some prefer cats because you just, you know, they go themselves. You don't have right. to worry about that. But there's pros and cons to both. But Buck's a cutie, and, uh, you know, I think Chad's pretty happy with him. Yeah, he just needs to, to quiet down during – he's still – you know, we're putting him in his kennel to sleep at night, trying to, uh, you know, teach him how to self-soothe and all that, and he keeps he's keeping us up. So he just needs to go to sleep, dang it. But, you guys, that's going to do it for today's episode of the Huddle Up Podcast. Thanks once again to each and every one of you for joining us live, especially our Super Chat donors. You guys are awesome. We love you so much. And we got a lot of stuff planned going into 2020 that uh, you'll want to stay tuned for. Make sure you're following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. Simply the best way to stay on top of everything that's happening with the show in real time. You can find my partner, Zach Kelberman, right here on Twitter, at KelbermanNFL, myself, at 
Chad and Jensen. Stay tuned because this might be the last Mile High Mailbag of the 2019 season for your football priest, but we're going to be back immediately following the Broncos Raiders game on Sunday. There will be one more gut reaction in the calendar year of 2019, and that's where you and I will uh, next speak, Zach, with these guys. But in the meantime, there is also going to be a scout side preview from Nick and Carl of Building the Broncos, and I'm sure even with the Christmas holiday and whatnot, I'm sure Eric and Lance are going to have something cooking up for Dove Valley Deep Divers. So there will be plenty of podcast content coming for you between now and game time. But, Zach, have a great west, uh, rest of your week, brother. You as well, and I think when we hop back on for our gut reaction, it's going to be a fairly happy one. That's my prediction for right now. Yeah, Drew Locke going 4-1 and one as a starter. What's up, Christy? Good to see you late there. Yeah, Drew and Locke uh, going 4-1 and one as a starter. It's very real, very possible. The Broncos have lost their last two games uh, when it comes to the Oakland Raiders, so they're motivated, long story short, to get this W. So we'll see how it shakes out. But, guys, have a great weekend. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll talk to you guys Sunday immediately following the game.